Who's that? Harry Stein? Listen, Mr. Murrow, we're getting a lot of noise on the circuit. Some kind of popping and rumbling. I know. Can BBC clear it up? I doubt it. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, I get the cue from Bob Trout straight up at 32. Ed, give me that. Ed, listen. Who's that? Paul? How are you, Paul? Where the hell are you? On the BBC roof. What for? The hell of a view. You got an air raid going on? Yeah, it looks like they're going to the docks again. Listen, Morrow, Mr. Paley's here. Hello, Bill. Now, Ed, you have our directive on this. You're not to put yourself into any unnecessary danger. Uh, hello, Paul. Paul? Well, I can't hear Paul. There's a problem on the circuit. Then get the hell off that roof. 30 seconds. The air ministry regulations don't... It's all right. I got permission an hour ago from the old man. What? Churchill. I called 10 Downing Street. What? Get off the roof! Don't worry. It's perfectly safe. 15 seconds. William L. Shira from Berlin. And now, reporting from Britain, CBS correspondent Edward R. Murrow. This is London. I'm standing on a rooftop looking out over London. Off to the left, I can just see the faint red angry snap of anti-aircraft against the steel blue sky. I think probably in a minute we shall have the sound of guns in the immediate vicinity. You're leaving Berlin, which gives me a hell of an excuse to get out of London for a few days. Do you know what they're going to have me doing? When? In New York. Did they, did they tell you? No. Why haven't they said anything? Bill, you've been with CBS a long time. Don't worry, you'll be back in New York with the baby and... What about the voice test? I saw what they said. Shara has no voice appeal. He's flat. Monotonous. I hired you because you know what you're talking about. No, they don't care. I mean, you remember 37? Hitler marching into Austria? They have me doing Christmas carols by American children in Vienna. You weren't with us when we first got to Europe. I thought the big story was the Germans bombing Guernica in Spain. New York was sore because NBC beat us out of the first All England singing mouse contest. And they don't give a damn now. They're not in the war. What's important is the... Lucky Strike Hit Parade. Oh, you're wrong. We do have impact back home. When Roosevelt sent over Harry Hopkins, Hopkins asked to see me before he checked in with Joe Kennedy at the embassy. He wanted to know how to handle Churchill. Then he said I should get back home and speak out for America to get into the war. Well, he's got a point. You can't believe what we're hearing in Berlin. Mass deportations, the killing Jews, hundreds of thousands of them. And I show up at polite receptions at the Adler. Now, they have the best French champagne, of course. Now, you go home and tell them that that's a hell of an idea. No, you missed the point. There's a difference between reporting news that'll make opinion and direct propaganda. That's the same thing in the end? But you have to draw the line. I mean, you, you can't make radio a privileged pulpit, but you have to report the truth as you see it. <laughs> We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. The details are not available. They will be in a few minutes. The White House is now giving out a statement. The attack apparently was made on all naval and on naval and military activities. On the principal island. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Janet, Janet, did you get through to the White House? I mean, certainly they don't expect us to come for dinner under the... What do you mean, come anyway? Who, who said? You talk to her? I mean, to Mrs. Roosevelt herself? She... She said we have to eat? What? Well, I just think it's going to be a hell of a long night at the White House. Henry L. Stimson today ordered the entire army into uniform. Executive effective tomorrow. His order applied. My God. What time is it? It's 12.30, Mr. President. Oh, you're Murrow, aren't you? That's right, Mr. President. Sit down. We've got beer coming, or would you prefer whiskey? 
Beer's fine. Sorry I missed dinner. Mrs. Murray will get home all right? Ah, uh, yes. She, she's at the hotel. Thank you. Hey. George. My hip. Ah, damn thing is cutting into the ribs. Ah. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. George. Uh, my mother was a woman of very strong opinions. Called them coffin nails. I think they are the vices that sustain life. Cigarettes. And martinis. I can go through about three packs a day. Now, the hop tells me you're the most influential American in England. Well, I don't think so. I'd appoint you ambassador, and Joe Kennedy would hand over Boston to the Republicans. <laughs> Before I appointed him, I called him in. He didn't know why. And I said, Joe, take down your trousers. He stood right there. He said, why, Mr. President? I said, never mind, Joe, just drop them. Now, I'm aware this story is strictly off the record. And he did. He dropped his trousers. He just stood there in his long drawers. And I said, my God, Joe, you're a bold legged. I said, how can I appoint you ambassador to the court of St. James? You look god-awful in knee breeches. <laughs> Now. Yes, sir. You never doubted we would be, did you? No, sir. After seeing how it went in Europe. I won't forget this day. My God. Wait till they hear out there what actually happened. If we tell them. They haven't counted them yet. There are more than 2,000 dead. 1,500 trapped in the Arizona, at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. And the planes take them field, all of them destroyed. On the ground. Damn it. On the ground. You listed the ships that were sunk? Probably 3,000 dead. And the planes? It was a complete disaster. We haven't even begun to receive the reports from the Philippines yet. They'll issue a communique. They'll have to. I don't know. I stopped by the CBS offices. There wasn't one damn word from the Department of War, Navy, or State. Not on the full extent of damages. He waited and waited. But he didn't say it. I mean, except for that damn fool story about Joe Kennedy dropping his pants, he put that off the record. What about Joe Kennedy's pants? Nothing. The point is, he did not give me an off-the-record warning about anything else. The truth is, I don't have the background for this job. I mean, anybody who ever worked for a real newspaper before would have called New York. Broken the net with a special bullet and get Bob Trout in London, Cecil Brown in... I don't think like that. My God, he looked old. He was careless. He should have put it off the record. He trusted me. I can't do it. What will you do? Cover Congress tomorrow? I mean, we are in the war now. Oh. I talked to somebody last week about a commission if we got in. He made it perfectly clear I'd be shoved into some public relations job in Washington. How will go back? London? Ed, won't the big news be in New York or Washington, at least for a while? There isn't really anything to worry about. Oh. You could get hit by a taxi in front of 485 Madison. They're not dropping 1,000-pound bombs on Madison Avenue.
I began to breathe and to reflect again that all men would be braver if they could leave their stomachs home. And then we were welcomed home by the calm, clear voice of an English girl. Later at the operations room, I noticed that some of the men I'd seen earlier at the briefing were not there. Berlin was a kind of orchestrated hell, a terrible symphony of light and flame. In about 35 minutes, it was hit with about three times the stuff that ever came down on London in a night-long blitz. This is a calculated, remorseless campaign of destruction. Right now, the mechanics are probably working on D-Dog, getting him ready to fly again. This is Edward R. Murrow, returning you to CBS in New York. Circuit's clear. Fine. Spot on, Mr. Murrow. New York got everything? Circuit's clear all the way. Everything all right, Major? Well, not for me to say. I mean, they approve the whole thing at the Ministry. You can hear the recording before they play it on their own service. Broadcast, Ed. Very, uh, very exciting. Thank you. Uh, Major, I'd like you to meet my boss in uh, Civvy Street, president of CBS. Of course, he's with Eisenhower's headquarters now, uh, Bill Bailey, Colonel William Bailey. Sir. Uh, Major Forsyth, our sensor, mm -hmm. has his finger on the switch to cut me off. Mm -hmm. No need to shed, sir. <laughs> I issued a direct order, damn it. Now, why did you go up in that Lancaster? It's where the war is, Bill. The point is, Frank Stanton does a very careful audience research poll, and your nightly broadcast is the most listened to on the air. Fred Allen once said that using a poll was like figuring out the national wheat crop by counting the poppy seeds on a single roll. Aside from the personal considerations, if you get yourself shot down over Berlin, you're no longer the most listened to. And CBS wants you safe here in London, Ed. Now, wait a minute. Uh, so, where do we go? Well, there's an underground station on Great Portland. But I don't usually bother. Hmm. We'll go down if you like. No, no, that's all right. Start going down in the shoulders, you lose your nerve. There's also a chance you, uh, you can lose your life. Actually, I'm very fond of life. I like what I'm doing, provided I have something to say. That's the thing about war. Philosophical questions have easy answers. You know what's right and what's wrong, and you do it. I don't think it's so easy. We took a lot of political heat before we even got into the war. Kept getting calls from those Senate subcommittees about, uh, about you. Oh? Why? Because every night at a quarter of eight, you were practically declaring war. That can't be a problem anymore. We're in the war. You don't think we still get pressured? <laughs> and every week you say something on the air and some senator hears it and calls the FCC. I don't like the FCC questioning CBS. It does seem an impertinence. <laughs> the point is, it's a personal embarrassment to me. Why? You're not president of CBS now. You're in the Army. Uh, I'll keep in touch, but Ed, look. There's a company policy not to put opinions in a news broadcast. Now, you do it more than anybody else, and I've told Paul White to leave you alone, but I can't tell the FCC. What do you want me to do, Bill? I don't know. It's a damn fool policy. You can't avoid opinion. Everybody does it his own way. Carlton born on NBC, Boke Carter on our network. You cut off everybody's walls, you end up with a soprano chorus in unison. Yeah, yeah, look, I'm on your side, but we can't throw away everything we've already built. I mean, when I got in this business, radio was nothing but a second-rate vaudeville show. Now, my God, we can, we can sit at that control board in New York and call in reporters from all over the world. What are you doing? What the hell is that? Bug bomb. As long as you can hear it, you're all right. Well, we heard about those. When the motor stops, they come down, right? And after the war, oh, sheer potential. Of what? Radio. Broadcasting. Jesus! Oh, that was close, huh? About two streets away. don't really understand back home. They can't see this. Hey, 
No, I think you underestimate yourself, Ed. Got the blitz and the damn near every home in America. See it. That's the power of what we built. After the war, it will continue. Important. Very important. Well, the point is, the only reason to be picking up voices all over the world is if they have something to say. Now we know where the enemy is and what the fight is. After the war, there's supposed to be any fights worth fighting. What it means, having lived through this whole god of Dameron. I just wonder if it won't all seem glad for you. I want you to promise me something, Ed. No more risks. I need you in one piece after the war. You need me. CBS, maybe. Same thing. You're all clear. Must be over. And now, get ready to smile again with radio's home folks. They can say, Rinso, the new Rinso with Solium. Brings you the Amos and Andy Show. For all the fancy breakfast you can see. Holmes Liniman presents Gangbusters. Camel Cigarettes present Benny Goodman Swing School. The Tuesday evening rally of everybody oh, everywhere. Oh, we're off our the new pulsating music of youth. Wait. All the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. The FBI in peace and war. Kellogg's Pep, the super delicious cereal presents Morning. the adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. And although NBC still leads in the ratings by a mean average of 3.5, the growth trend since the end of the war indicates a CBS upturn. Why don't we hold off on that till after lunch, okay, Frank? Uh, I have to deliver my president's report to the full CBS board at three. You have plenty of time. What do you think of that burgundy, Ed? Oh, modestly superb. <laughs> Jock Whitney served it the other day. I asked him to uh, send me a case. I have the second quarter's earning by his Friday bill, but I can estimate them now. Good. After, um, after coffee, all right? Oh, Ed. I ran, in, uh, ran into the governor last week at uh, dinner. He asked me what I thought about Churchill's speech, the one, uh, the one at the college. What did you think about it? Turns a hell of a phrase, doesn't he? Mm. I mean, from Stettin on the Baltic to somewhere on the Adriatic, an iron curtain is descending over Europe. Mm -hmm. he tends to forget that he was there when the deals were made with Stalin. You have a long memory, Ed. But accurate, I think. Uh, sometimes such an accurate memory can be a liability. What do you mean by that, Frank? Well, in the last year, there's been an exponential rise in the level of hysteria about things pertaining to communism. Uh, who are they, anyway, the damn lunatic fringe? Are they the same ones that uh, were bitching about uh, Ed's speeches during the war? A number of very important people in Washington, several national newspaper chains, Bill, public opinion is my field, and it is what generates profit in broadcasting. Do you remember when the Dyes Committee was hunting communist influence on radio? Mm. They called in some of our scripts then, some of Ed's. Mm, that's petty headline hunting. Mm. They got them. Mm. Well, should you have coffee? What is the problem, Ed? Is it the title? Is that it? Vice President, Director of Public Affairs. That's the American dream, isn't it? Vice President and Director of something? Anything. Well, what then? Salary? It can't be that. No, 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 no. The salary is relatively princely. Well, I just don't understand. Yeah, maybe Ed's a little uncomfortable with exercising executive authority. Now, oh, what does that mean, Frank? My God, he practically ran Europe during the war. Now, I want you, Ed. I need you, just like I need Frank. Uh, I'm not too comfortable with the idea of judging people, of disciplining people, of firing them. Who the hell am I to fire anybody, God Almighty? Ed, I mean, that goes with the job. I mean, it's like, uh, like Shakespeare, King, King Richard. Uneasy lies the head. 
Ted, have, have you forgotten? I mean, we, we started this together. I needed you during the war. I need you now. I want CBS to have an aura of integrity, and honesty. And Frank's right. We're being attacked now. We're in the goddamn middle. Liberals are hollering about uh, sponsor influence on the news. Westbrook Pegler and the Dyes Committee are, are screaming communist. I want you up front. I want you up front. I want CBS standing behind Edward R. Murrow, just like during the war. God damn it. I have a vision of American broadcasting that... Actually, I'm not too comfortable with American broadcasting. It seems so strident. Too many years at the BBC. I can't get used to the commercials. You are back in America, Ed. Those commercials, strident or not, are the center, the support, and to a degree, the whole purpose of broadcasting. It occurs to me that a loud voice that reaches from coast to coast may not necessarily have anything of worth to say. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, this industry has got to be... Maybe you don't follow me, Bill. This industry has got to be a hell of a lot more than an industry. It has to hold up a mirror to the nation, to the world. That mirror must have no curves. And it must be held with a steady hand. Were you listen to him? And what was I just saying? Wasn't I just saying, wasn't I saying exactly that, Frank? Substantially. Uh, that's my vision, Ed. That's CBS News under Edward R. Murrow. What's going here? Who the hell do you think you are? Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane? No, no. <laughs> All right. My wife gave me this Indian. But I was, uh, in wholesale cigars before. I got into this business. La Polina cigars. I remember one day in uh, 1925, my father and uncle were out of town, and I, uh, I decided to buy a program on, uh, WCAU, the Miss La Polina Hour, I called it. Uncle Jake, just sore as hell. Fifty dollars, just total waste. So they they canceled the show, and then people started stopping my father on the street and asking what happened to the La Polina Hour, and sales had gone up. So I, um, I bought the station. And now I'm chairman of the board. Stan, fascinated with the numbers. Profit statements, power, you know what I want? Conscience. Integrity. More scotch? Sam Aaron imports this for me. A single malt liquor. Ed, I'm down to my last network. There's no use in getting upset, Don. You know what happened at ABC. In the middle of my regular news program, there was this god-awful, sickening commercial for Marlin Shave Cream. Well, I was a commentator, so I commented. It took Kintner only three hours to fire me, and for two of them, he was out to lunch. You're taking this too hard, Don. Have you read the papers? About the kindest thing they suggest is Hollenbeck is a communist. Yeah, we knew we'd be in trouble the minute we started this program. You knew it. All we had to do was announce the title, CBS views the press, and their backs went up. But Crosby gave us a good review, so did Variety. Take it easy, Don. You're a vice president, Ed. What am I? Don Hollenbeck, that red bastard. I've been through this before. At ABC and NBC and... This is CBS. 
That program was thought up in this office. I was for it. Paley was for it. We knew when we started critiquing the press, they'd, they'd have a bug up their ass. They told me the mail's running against me. It's Bill Shire on, too. Tell him I'll call him as soon as... He says it's urgent. Would you hold on a second, Bill? Don, as far as CBS is concerned, you're doing a solid job. I don't know. We just adopted a little girl. I've been through it. It's damned easy to throw somebody to the wolves. I don't think I could take it again. You have my assurance. You're not the last word. Haley is, and he'll back you. You just keep telling the truth. I'm sorry, I have to do that. Hello? Yeah, Bill? You're damn right, I'm sure. Now, wait a minute. Now, the agency man came right out with it. J.B. Williams' company is dropping me from the Sunday 545, so that's it. Finished. When did this... You know what really gets me, Ed? I mean, besides losing my show and a hell of a commercial fee... They sent the sponsor's errand boy to fire me. Look, why don't we go up to my office? We can't discuss it. No, 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 Ed. Let's not go up into the vice presidential suite. Ed, how much did you know about this? I had no idea. You're weaseling, Ed. Did you know? Hell, was it your idea? What do you have, Mr. Moreau? Nothing. Ah, uh, coffee. I knew there was pressure. I expect a shaving cream company to be damned unhappy with political attacks in the press, but I didn't expect you to cave in. Well, I want you to calm down. You're not answering me, Ed. All right, I talked to Ted about your work. And I looked over your scripts myself. You haven't been doing your legwork, Bill. You've been pulling your programs out of the editorial pages of the New York Times. That is it. All right, let's put that aside. Because that isn't what this is about. It's political, damn it, and you know it. I'm about the last commentator in radio who is still asking questions about the Truman Doctrine. I am the only one who hasn't fallen into line behind, what did Baruch call it? The Cold War. You're going to have to believe me, Bill. CBS is not trying to get rid of you for political reasons. This whole thing has been botched. J.B. Williams had no right to send some junior agency man to handle it. Oh. Thank you. No. So who was supposed to do the hatchet job, Ed? You? You have 18 months to go on your contract. You're going to have another spot on the network. Sustaining? That I can't tell. Well, let me tell you, Ed. Losing a regular commercial show is not only one hell of a financial loss, which it is. There is also professional reputation. Nobody can question The one me. after the other. Every commentator that they call liberal. Bill Gaylmer at NBC, Quincy Howe in our shop, even Mayor LaGuardia was turned down at WOR. So are you cooperating and making it a clean sweep, Ed? You know, let's get Shire off and we'll have a 100% clean sweep. I'm telling you, CBS News will keep you on as long as you want. You know, we go back a long way together, Ed. 37? <laughs> you brought me into CBS. I didn't want the job. <laughs> what the hell was radio in those days? But you were my friend. I mean, damn it, Janet was my baby's godmother. I knew we didn't agree politically. You have no problem with Truman's view of the world. But, but I always thought you had integrity and guts. Give me a little time, will you? <laughs> I'll straighten it out so the announcement does the least harm. No, no, you go ahead and say whatever a CBS vice president has to say. Now, I've got my last show on Sunday, and I'm going to tell the truth about my leaving. And if anyone, for example, the press, wants to ask any further questions, then I will answer with the truth. <laughs> This off the air from the experimental transmitter downtown. There's a little problem with atmospherics. Bill. Well, where? Yeah, you know, my office, right? Excuse me. Very disturbed about the Shire business. I know. I get a headache from that damn thing. I, uh, I know you're distressed about Shire. It is distressing. And dangerous for the company. Well, everybody's going to think he was dumped politically for one world views. Now, wait a minute. He never was that cooperative with the company. I mean, he 
turn down that uh, uh, Wrigley show? Well, that has nothing to do with it. I would remind you that you yourself raised questions about his work. I know, but who's going to believe that now? No, Ed, we've faced this issue before. My God, you, you answered uh, Jack Gould brilliantly in the Times. You made it very clear that no sponsor can control content of any CBS news program. But uh, they do have the right to decide whether or not they're going to sponsor a particular show. Well, I may have been a little too brilliant. That kind of half-truth can hang us now. Well, Ed, uh, the Williams Company simply feels that Shire doesn't have uh, sufficient appeal. Well, to be accurate, his Hooper rating is 9.6. That's pretty good for a Sunday show. Personally, I would have kept him on. Well, Frank, we can't force him down a sponsor's throat. But... Yeah, I, I think maybe you'd better make a statement, um, a very, very strong statement. Reaffirm the network's absolute control of news content. And, um, you know, well, I know you know that uh, I would never tolerate censorship in CBS News. Neither would Frank. I mean, look at Hollenbeck and... CBS News, the press. I packed that show all the way. I'm very proud of that show. Okay? Now then, uh, Sunday. I think maybe, maybe you'd better be in the control room uh, for Shire's broadcast and just uh, keep your finger on the cutoff. Just use your own judgment. This is very difficult for me. I brought Bill in to CBS. Frank is president of the company. No, Ed, I want everybody to know that Edward R. Murrow is CBS News, that you speak for the network. You're the boss. Sure, I got a minute. I just handed in my resignation. Kay said she put it on your desk. Damn it, Bill. Was... I read your article in the Times, Ed. You're bringing Joe Harsh from Washington to take my spot. I wish you'd come upstairs and tear up that resignation. Bill, what do you want me to do, Ed? Grant you absolution? I won't do it. I want you to know that despite appearances, I'm not caving into political pressure. Neither is Bill Paley. You know, Ed, I think maybe the difference is where we spent the early years of the war. You were in Britain. You admired Churchill, the whole establishment. Good show, stout fellas all. And I watched Germany and Austria slide all the way to acquiesce in the worst of Nazi and Hitler philosophy. I tell you what, I don't share your touching faith in authority. You remind me of the good Germans I knew in Berlin. They too put their faith in princes. And some ended up hanging on a meat hook with a piano wire around their neck. Goodbye, Ed. Not bad. Ed, I do wish you'd think about this a little bit more. I have thought about it. Well, what is it? Is it uh, still the Shire thing? Or... Well, I, I just think I don't like doing what you have to do as a vice president. It's not at all what I had in mind, Bill. I, I don't understand that. You remember the definition of a diplomat? A man sent abroad to lie for his country. Oh, wait a minute, Ed. I mean, you, you didn't say one word about Shire that you didn't believe. Well, it's not only that. I, mean, I, I feel pulled, as if I've lost purpose. I want to get back on the air. I know Campbell Soup wants me for a nightly show. Yeah, I heard about that. Frank says it's a multi-million dollar deal. Well, there you are, good for CBS. Well, yeah, but I don't like that. I wanted you to be a vice president. I don't know how the hell you can walk away from a deal like this, Ed. And remember, if you do get back into active broadcasting, it won't be like during the war. I mean, there won't be any burning buildings to broadcast from. Maybe I can set fire to 485 Madison. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right, Ed, have it your way, but uh, I'm not doing this uh, 
because it means an extra million and a half to the company every year. I'm doing this, I want to. I want you near me. Oh, there is one more thing, though. Frank says I should keep you on the board of directors. I'm going to do that. Whatever you say, Bill. This program is not a place where personal opinion should be mixed up with ascertainable facts. It is not, I think, humanly possible for any reporter to be completely objective. And we shall try to remember that the mechanics of radio, which make it possible for an individual voice to be heard throughout the entire land, don't confer great wisdom or infallibility on that individual. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your Lincoln Mercury dealer presents Ed Sullivan. It's howdy doody! And now, here he is, the star of our show, Jackie Gleason! The updated quarterly profit statement indicates a 12% rise in television network revenues over the previous quarter and a 38% rise compared to the same quarter last year. Thank you, Frank. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen, you all have a copy of the full report in front of you. If there are no questions, I would like to move on to the next item on the agenda. Go ahead, Frank. This is the matter we were discussing at the last meeting, the continued attacks on the corporation on the so-called communist issue. Now, board members will recall that we reported that several former FBI agents were publishing a pamphlet called Counterattack, which purported to list actors, directors, producers, and executives in the industry suspected of communist affiliations, or more often sympathies. This same organization has published a book. It's a rather provocative title, Red Channels. Now, I know a number of you have already seen it, and we're particularly disturbed by the statement charging CBS as the most satisfying network for the communist. Mr. Chairman, is that actionable? We've got to do something. If, if we don't, we don't, don't react react to this thing, thing. We have in taken in action. Way. We have, in fact, hired three ex-FBI men to undertake research. That is to check all CBS employees for possible communist ties and general loyalty. It's clear that having such men working for the company, we expect the attacks to diminish. And I'm pleased to report that in the main, our employees have received a clean bill of health. A few low-grade clericals have been discharged, and one or two producers have resigned. Unfortunately, the attacks do continue on CBS. Partially, certain on-air activities have exacerbated the situation. You mean Murrow's program? We all know it. Counterattack charges Murrow slants the news to the left. Gentlemen, please, let's let uh, Dr. Stanton finish, please. I submit, gentlemen, that content of news programs is out of order at this table. How about Jack O'Brien and the Journal? Come on, Ed. Mr. Chairman. Firing a couple of secretaries Bob, is not going to get us Bob, off the hook. Bob, you know Bob, that. Bob, please. I assume that control of CBS News has not yet passed over to euphemistically titled researchers, nor to the U.S. Senate, where Mr. McCarthy, junior senator from Wisconsin, is currently leading the attack against us. Mr. Chairman, you get us into controversy. What happens to the real business of this corporation, the bottom profit line? <coughs> what about that, yes. Mr. Murray? Someone once said something to the effect, what profit is the man if he gained the entire world? Oh, but that's not the point. <laughs> You're not going to solve this. You believe that? Then one minute again. Again. Gentlemen, please, Mr. Murrow happens to be correct. Now, the network will not give one inch on control of its own operation. And to that end, we'll require a loyalty oath of every CBS employee with the Attorney General's subversive list attached. If anybody fails to sign and is dismissed, well, that's not the responsibility of CBS. But I would like, uh, would like to move on to a happier subject if we can. Frank. Thank you. I'm pleased to report that since the successful negotiations which brought Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, and Burns and Allen from NBC to CBS, plus the addition of new television creative programming, notably the new Arthur Godfrey series. We continue to hold a substantial lead over NBC in all Nielsen ratings. Well, yeah. well. Actually, it's the, the Whitney box 
the new in-laws. I may have to stand through the whole damn opera. Which one is it? Well, I don't know. Opening night, who knows? Go ahead, uh, What about your show? Do you have a name for it? Oh, sure, see it now. Yeah. It's like Hear It Now, the radio show I've been doing with Fred Friendly, only on television. See it now. Well, how's, how's he with the television? Oh, he's fine. Yeah. He has a real feel for production, and uh, he's nothing if not enthusiastic. Well, I hope he has an eye for cost, because if he comes in with a show way over budget, I'm going to have a hell of a time depending it to the board. Oh, I thought you were the boss, Bill. The crowned king. I am. I am, but uh, some people have the notion you rule like, uh, like the early Plantagenets, or Queen Elizabeth. Actually, it's more like Charles II fighting with his parliament. You know, Edward, television's a different thing than radio. So Fred's been telling me. Yeah, get away with a little bit more on radio. Like that uh, fellow who worked for the State Department when the Alger Hiss case broke. Larry Duggan. Yeah, jumped out of a window and the committee accused him of being a communist and you defended him on radio? I knew Larry for years. I worked very closely with his father. Well, no, I, I'm sure you're right. And, uh, you know, I applaud that. But that's, that's radio. Television, the stakes are a little higher. Something like that caused big problems for the corporation. Bill, when we do this new show, we expect to be free to do whatever. I know. I expect you to be strong, straightforward, but uh, reasonable. That's well, very strange, Ed. There you are. You have the top-rated radio news show on the air. You're about to go into television. And somehow I get the feeling that you were happier crouching under a table in a London air raid. There's some truth in that. Well, maybe you should look at Frank's audience projection sometime. I'm telling you, we could change the whole world. Into what? William James did speak of the moral equivalent of war. As Mr. McCorber put it, something will turn up. <coughs> and collaborated with communists and pro-communists, consorting with admitted espionage agents. And I wish to say to this committee, what I said on the floor of the Senate, gentlemen, here is a man with a mission, a mission to communize the world, a man whose energy and intelligence coupled with a burning, all-consuming mission, has raised him by his own bootstraps from a penniless operator of a communist, strike the word leftist, make that communist, the obvious area... Yeah, the Chairman, problem is we don't have any film on that Wheeling, West Virginia speech. If we had that, huh. he's waving papers around, charging the State Department hires communists. This is just file film. I want a lot more. If we could put a couple of crews on it, send Joe to Washington. In time, Fritzl, in time. Why not now? There is no bigger story. Senator Joe McCarthy, we can start putting it together next week. Take Jack back off the Navajo story. Got to get to the studio. We haven't settled this, Ed. Sorry, Fritzl. Can't be late. This is the tech monster on the new show. I don't know why you need a new show, Ed. I'm telling you. Person to person, interviewing movie stars. That's for, uh, for Godfrey, this it's not for you. This is the show I have to do so we can do the shows we want to do, Fritzl. Please, pl uh, please not Fritzl. I'm very far from Fred. being Teutonic. Fred, Fred. Look at me. We have to make a decision about the McCarthy program. I'm telling you, Ed, it's not just McCarthy in Washington. It is right here at CBS. We wanted Seymour to write the new theme music for the show. So I go up to the talent office. The guy says, is he in the book? I start giving him the phone number. He says, not the telephone book, right. the book. Okay, he opens up the drawer, and there it is. Yeah, red on, channels, paper clips, used Kleenex, and red channels. The guy says, this is the book we live by. Mr. Moon, the set, please. Have you got the order, Ed? Uh, yeah, I think so, Jesse. Stokowski, Gloria Vanderbilt. No, no, there's been a change. Roy Campanella first, then Stokowski, Gloria Vanderbilt. I've got to do the mix on next week's show. Fritzl, keep collecting film on McCarthy. Yeah, but when are we going when to start? It's time. If you're going to shoot at a king, you've got to kill him. All right, quiet, please. Ed, can you see Roy on the monitor? Uh, yes, just fine. 
How do you do, Mr. Campanella? How's the hand? <laughs> oh, Fred, finally got the footage. Listen, I'm on my way out to lunch, uh, and I want you to look at this. It's from the Detroit Free Press. I want you to check it out. It might be our story. Lieutenant Milo Radu Radulovich. <laughs> They're kicking him out of the Air Force because his father and sister are supposed to be left-wing sympathizers. Let's get somebody on it. This might be our next little picture. Well, I can send Joe to Detroit, but if we do... I'll talk to you about it after lunch, huh? He's a natural. Yeah, Milo Radulovich. Crew cut Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. They hauled him in front of an Air Force board and bounced him as a security risk. The Air Force no, no, they damn near threw me out. Listen, Fred, the kid is going to be very convincing on film. I want you to send me Charlie Mack and a film crew. He was in the Air Force for 10 years. He's in the reserve now, meteorologist. Dulovich, take one. Better be good, Fritz. Well, I haven't had dinner yet. Uh, the Air Force does not question my loyalty in the least. Uh, they've presented me with allegations against my sister and my father to the effect that my sister and my dad have taken uh, or have read what are now called subversive newspapers and that my sister and my father's activities are questionable. Uh, that's the specific charge or allegation, I prefer to call it, against them. Uh, against me, the actual charge is that I maintained a close and continuing relationship with my dad and sister over the years. The Air Force say anything? No. What about neighbors, friends? Oh, Joe says uh, there's a guy at the local gas station. He'll speak out for Milo. He's a commander in the American Legion. We have a hell of a segment here. Well, I don't think we can do this in 10 or 12 minutes. I think we better use the whole half hour on it. Next Tuesday, shop. Well, it's now Thursday night. Friday morning. We have to get some kind of comment from the Pentagon. You check, see if CBS will give us some special promotion. I'll work on the end piece. OK. I serve America in the Army in the First World War. My boy, Milo, was in this last war. My whole life, my whole family is American. Editing. Yeah, he's right here, Mr. Friendly. Mr. President, I am American. Yeah. Good? No, no, no. I'm running the footage of... Right now? Here, Mr. President. Huh? The general? No, no, I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. With heavy heart. Because they are doing bad things to Milo. Frankly, Mr. Morrow, we were surprised you were even interested in a little case like this. Yes, well, uh, we're always interested in the little picture, General. Well, you understand, uh, in days like these, uh, the Cold War, as it were, we have to lean over backwards on security issues for the, uh, the national security. Well, uh, we want to be fair and balanced here, and we want to give the Air Force every chance to explain and justify their action. But how can we if you won't let us interview anybody on camera? Well, I understand your problem, but uh, well, perhaps things will work out. Uh, uh, taking the pressure off both of us. I just feel you'll come to appreciate our problem. And that no one will have to make any comment. You're suggesting the program won't go on the air? Well, uh, that will be a CBS decision, completely. Yes, it will. Well, you've always had very close ties with the Air Force. Indeed, you still do. If you're referring to my brother as a career officer... Well, I hadn't thought of that. I meant your own interest. I remember we did give you the Distinguished Service to Air Power Award. You've always had absolute cooperation from the Air Force. We just feel you wouldn't do anything to change that. You think they'll go right up to the 20th floor? I imagine they'll call Washington, and Washington will call the 20th floor. How close are you to a final cut? We've got to get 15 hours of film cut down to half an hour. Give me three or four minutes on the end. 
If we don't get a statement from the Air Force, don't we run into company policy? I mean, about fairness. Somebody's going to start yelling about lack of balance. Fritzel, some issues just aren't equally balanced. Do we go on the air with a fairy tale that for every argument on one side, there's an equal one on the other? Well, they won't pay for the ad. What ad? The New York Times. Bill Golden called me this morning. CBS won't pay for it. Oh, how much? I don't know exactly. What do we do with that prize money from last year? Well, it's in, it's in the bank. We'll pay for the ad ourselves. There were so many stars. Well, if we lose the feed from the film train, we'll just go to the live camera. Uh, there's the ad in the Times. We didn't use a CBSI. We just signed it Ed Murrow Friend Friendly. Seems fair how we paid for it. Yeah. Oh, Golden called me this morning. They wanted cash. They wouldn't put it on the regular company account. Okay, folks, coming up for air. That's all. I don't know if we'll get away with this one or not. Things will never be the same around here after tonight. Fifteen seconds. Still collecting film? On the senator. McCarthy. Ten seconds. Tonight's show may be a small footnote of what happens next. Five. Four. Three. Cue opening film. Alcoa, Aluminum Company of America, in cooperation with CBS Television, presents the distinguished reporter and news analyst Edward R. Murrow in See It Now. We believe that the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, even though that iniquity be proved, and in this case it was not. But we believe, too, that this case illustrates the urgent need for the armed forces to communicate more fully than they have so far done the procedures and regulations to be followed in attempting to protect the national security and the rights of the individual at the same time. Whatever happens in this whole area of the relationship between the individual and the state, we will do it ourselves. It cannot be blamed on Malenkov or Mao Zedong or even our allies. And it seems to us, that is to Fred Friendly and myself, that it is a subject that should be argued about endlessly. We're off. Over 2,000 calls, almost all of them favorable. What about Detroit? They don't show it in Detroit till Thursday. And there's no call for management. What? CBS management. Nobody called. Maybe they weren't watching. Hey, Ed! Ed! I got the time from you! It's not even on the street yet. I got a kid who called me from the city room, and he had a copy of Jack Gould's column for tomorrow, and I'm telling you, it's terrific. Listen to this. Uh, CBS, see it now. Uh, the program marked, perhaps for the first time, that a major network, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and an important sponsor, the Aluminum Company of America, consented to a program taking a vigorous stand in a matter of national importance and controversy. Amen. Gentlemen, I suggest we drink to the major network and the important sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Ed. Hmm. About 20 minutes ago, we were up all night cutting the Indianapolis uh, Legion footage. No, no, I was in the shower. Yeah, I'm dripping all over the goddamn rug. I was shaving when he called. Hmm? Secretary of the Air Force. No, no, Talbot himself. Listen, I want you to get Charlie Mack and the camera crew over to the Pentagon by 9 o'clock. For tonight's show? How in the hell can I cut five minutes out of a show that's already in the can? Fritzel, listen to me. L listen to me. If the Air Force were going to stand pat, they wouldn't be calling us at 7.30 in the morning. Yeah, the bastards are going to reverse on Radulovich. Son of a bitch! That's great! <laughs> I think so. How much film do you have now? No, 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 on Senator McCarthy. Uh, about 50,000. But we don't have the wheeling speech. I don't want to do anything without... Fritzel, I think the timing is right. I want to start active work on, on the McCarthy project. Hmm? Huh? I'm not sure. Well, we'll schedule it when we're ready. Okay. Well, I can't... Well, I can't report that we agreed entirely on everything. <laughs> uh, I can... Who's the hell with the coverage of the attack on General Zwicker? We have the transcript of the closed hearing. 
It's not the same thing as a close-up of that man telling the hero of D-Day, you're not fit to wear the uniform. Don't you trust words, Fred? Television, Ed. Pictures. Pictures. If we had them, you wouldn't be stalling about the I'm scheduling of the show. stalling. It's timing. I thought you were in Washington. Hold it. Hold it. Oh. Joe called me. I want him to tell you this himself. Yesterday, I ran into Don Serene, the Senate office building. Uh, he's McCarthy's investigator. Yeah. He's bounced out of the FBI. Well, uh, he said something like, what's Murrah trying to do with that Radwich, or whatever the hell his name is? I take it he meant Radulovich. Yeah. He said, Murrah, better be careful. What would you say if I told you we had definite proof that Murrah was a paid agent of the Soviet Union? Well, I sort of implied I thought he was full of shit. He said, come on up to the office, and he'd show me. I had some photostats made. It's the Pittsburgh Sun-Telegraph, February 18th, 1935. American professors trained by Soviets to teach in U.S. schools. Where does it mention, Ed? Oh, it's way down in the article. Lists an assistant director of the Institute of International Education, Edward R. Murrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was an exchange program for university summer sessions. 1935. He's threatening us with a 20-year-old news clip. We never even got to Moscow. Russians called off the whole thing. Well, better give these to CBS Legal, just in case. Fritzl, I want about 30 seconds on the end of this week's show. What for? I want to make a little announcement. Something about the climate of unreasoning fear we're living in. And next week, we'll deal with one aspect of that fear. McCarthy next week. I think we'd better. <laughs> <laughs> it's the goddamnedest piece of luck, Ed. Well, maybe it isn't luck. We've had Joe and Charlie Mack covering McCarthy everywhere. Got to get down with the first in person run through. Well, you gotta come back and see the complete footage before we cut it. He was at this Washington birthday dinner in Philadelphia. Charlie Mack's got the whole thing on film. Single camera, it's a masterpiece. McCarthy took this wicker transcript, the private closed hearing, and he read it. He played all the parts. Whenever he gets off a good one, he breaks into this high, crazy, nervous giggle. Sounds good. Oh, it's devastating. Ed, they are very, very worried and legal. We know what McCarthy's going to throw at you, but everybody who works on the show is going to be a target, if, and it is a real possibility, there is a weak point. We ought to know about it now before McCarthy hangs it around our neck. We'll talk about it. Sorry I'm late, boss. All right. Well, we've all been over the show. I know some of you feel we don't have enough hard footage. No, no, McCarthy's got a couple of hearings scheduled next week. He's got two speeches, too, so, uh, I don't know. Why don't we just wait and see what turns up? I don't agree. We have the general picture for 25 minutes. Ed's piece at the end will nail it down. All right. Now, something else. We all know that Ed is going to be the target of a counterattack after the show. But we had better know now if there is anything about anybody here that will make us vulnerable to McCarthy. We have to know now. As far as any risk from CBS, I'll go surety for it. All right, who's going to start? I will. My name is not Fred Friendly. Actually, it's Ferdinand Friendly Wackenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> and when I went into radio in Providence, somebody suggested that, well, I changed it to Fred W. Friendly. Um, actually, uh, my wife, that is my first wife, was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, I guess it was 1937. Uh, we've been divorced since 43. I, I don't know if she still is. I doubt it. I ran for the Radio Writers Guild Council when I was in CBS News. There was another slate. They were calling us communist sympathizers. My name went into the record at the McCarran Committee. That's all.
The terror is right here in this room. <clears throat> Implied in this meeting is a question. Will this program go on the air? There's no question. We, like everybody else in this business, will be judged by what we put on the air, but we shall also be judged by what we don't broadcast. I'll have the script for the end piece of the program on your desk in the morning. Okay, let's go to work. Morning, Ed. Come in. Sit down. You want some coffee? No, thank you. you seen the Times this morning? Yes, I did. No. Very good ad. Night at 10.30 on See It Now, a report on Senator Joseph R. McCarthy. Very, very good. Very, very simple. Fred and I paid for it, personally. I know. I know. We could run the film for you. No, no. No. You always had complete autonomy. That's the way I want it. No, I don't want to hear any details. Not, uh, not before it goes on the air. All right. Okay. All right. Oh, one thing. Uh, you have to make damn sure that you offer McCarthy uh, equal time. That's very important to CBS's position vis-a-vis -vis any kind of uh, trouble. We're working on that. Good. Yeah. Now, what about Frank? Did you uh, discuss the program with Frank? No. Ed, network president. It's the way you set it up, Bill. I know. <laughs> yeah, but it does make for friction. Friction is no good. Oh, by the way, Ed, I, I went to Washington last week, and I had uh, lunch with the president. Personally, uh, he doesn't like the senator. None of them do. None of the real Republican leadership. They think, uh, I think he's out of control. Is that the problem? They can't control him? Mm, no, you know what I mean. You think Eisenhower or any of the real Republicans are going to do anything about McCarthy? No. No, not right now. They're afraid of him. That's his weapon, Bill, fear. And his ability to use us, us, our cameras, our news programs. That and the silence of timid men, we made McCarthy. We let him sell himself on television like underarm deodorant. If he's a monster, he's our monster. Well, I don't agree with that, Ed. I, I don't agree with that at all, as far as television is concerned. And I, I go to those damn cocktail parties, and I, I meet those snobs that say, uh, I don't watch television. I think it's mindless. But I tell them, you know, CBS may bring you I Love Lucy, but we also bring you Edward R. Murrow. But Ed, for God's sake, uh, we, we must have objectivity. I mean, that's the bellwether, objectivity. But not blindness, Bill. McCarthy and anybody like him pollutes the channels of communication. And if we, I mean all of us, radio, television, newspapers, if we don't speak out against him, we have to share responsibility for everything he does. That's good. That's good. I agree with that. I'm proud of it. Oh, Edward. Sometimes I wish I were in your position. You don't have to give a damn. That's a very enviable position to be in. Very, very enviable. I have to work on my summation. Oh, Ed. Um, I'll, um, I'll be with you tonight. I'll, uh, I'll be with you tomorrow as well. Thank you, Bill. Wash it away. Wash years away with loving care hair color lotion by Come Claire. On, no, I want uniform guards on the door. I don't want... No. Nobody gets in. Absolutely nobody. I don't want any nut busting in here when we're on the air. Come on, just give us the 10, 59, 26, okay? Yeah, hello. No, this is not the 11 o'clock news. Thank you and good night. Yeah, hello. Yeah, um, operator, operator, look. Every week I ask you to shut off all calls. Can you understand what that means? <laughs> That's right. No calls. 30 seconds. Okay, folks, come on. Let's settle down here. <sighs> this is going to be a tough one. After tonight, they're all going to be tough. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. Good evening. Tonight, See It Now devotes its entire half hour to a report on Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, told mainly in his own words and pictures. Hold them as I see them, regardless of who oh. happens to be present. Earlier, the senator asked, upon what meat does this our Caesar feed? 
Had he looked three lines earlier in Shakespeare's Caesar, he would have found this line, which is not altogether inappropriate. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. No one familiar with the history of this country can deny that congressional committees are useful. It is necessary to investigate before legislating. But the line between investigating and persecuting is a very fine one, and the junior senator from Wisconsin has stepped over it repeatedly. We must remember always that accusation is not proof and that conviction depends on evidence and due process of law. We will not walk in fear of one another. We will not be driven by fear into an age of unreason if we dig deep in our history and doctrine and remember we are not descended from fearful men, not from men who feared to write, to speak, to associate with, and to defend causes which were for the moment unpopular. This is no time for men who oppose Senator McCarthy's methods to keep silent. We can deny our heritage and our history, but we cannot evade responsibility for the result. There is no way for a citizen of a republic to abdicate his responsibilities. We proclaim ourselves, as indeed we are, the defenders of freedom, what's left of it. But we cannot defend freedom abroad by deserting it at home. The actions of the junior senator from Wisconsin have caused alarm and dismay amongst our allies abroad and given considerable comfort to our enemies. And whose fault is that? Not really his. He didn't create the situation of fear. He merely exploited it, and rather successfully. Cassius was right. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Good night. And good luck. We're off. Ed, I punched up the local news. Don Hollenbeck. Honey, give me audio. I don't know whether all of you have seen what I just saw, but I want to associate myself and this program with what Ed Murrow has just said. And I have never been prouder of CBS. The Senate today passed the Eisenhower. Listen, it's awfully quiet. I know, I know. You see a bunch of anybody out there? I think it's a They may well have. They may go under I didn't think we were going to get off in time. Yeah. Where the hell are all the phone calls? The press department set up a whole bank of operators. Didn't anybody hear us out there? Well, doesn't anybody give a damn? Mr. Hewitt, the phone operators want to know if it's all right to put any calls through. You asked them not to, but they're swamped. <laughs> Don Hewitt. Yeah, yeah, yes, operator, I know what I said. Just, just put all the calls through. Right, all of them. Yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah? Uh, no. You, you did? No, this is uh, Mr. Friend. That's terrific. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell yes, Mr. Burrow that. Yes. Yes, and you did. Right. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. And yes. Hello. Well, yes. you, you did. Yes, thank you. Liked it. Well, thank you. That's, well, 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 that's very kind of the way we feel about it, too. Thank you very, thank you very yes. much. The calls are two to one favorable, at least on the East Coast. The Washington switchboard had 500 calls. Only 40 were anti. Good, good. Mm. Wonder what the hell he'll hit us with, though. He's not going to get very far with that old Russian exchange student stuff. Maybe he has my old IWW card. You, your what? The Wobblies. You carried a card in the IWW? You never told us that before. Actually, I don't really remember if I did or not. That was the first year before I went to college. I worked out in the woods in Washington. I was a whistle punk on the donkey engine. Ed, did you or didn't you? Well, those were the early 20s, Fred, and a lot of guys out in the woods carried IWW cars just for protection. Only 
think I actually did. Hope the hell Roy Cohn doesn't find out about this. I was saving up for my first year at college. Wish I could call her. Who? Ida Lou Anderson. She was my teacher out there, public speaking. She was crippled, must have been polio. God help me if I ever dangled a participle on a broadcast. I'd hear from her. I remember it was in my first year she put me on to Marcus Aurelius. In English, not Latin. If thou workest at that which is before thee, following right reason, expecting nothing, fearing nothing, but satisfied with thy present activity, and with heroic truth in every word and sound which thou utterest, thou wilt live happy, and there is no man who can prevent this. Good. Hey, you're Ed Murrow, right? Hey, listen, you gave that son of a bitch hell point by point, you nailed him to the wall. Keep at it. Uh, Harry Truman, Margaret Truman, uh, Bishop Shield from Chicago, he wants you to call back. I've got your marks. Here's Jack O'Brien in the journal. The Columbia Broadcasting System has been in a lengthy clean house of lefties mood. Murrow, however, has led a charmed existence. His, his Svengali-like influence over the top officers of the corporation has molded many a CBS attitude to the handling of both personnel and news. He goes on to take another couple of shots at Don Hollenbach. I'll look at it later. Any word from the McCarthy people? Indirectly, he issued a press statement saying that he was too busy that he was going to ask William Buckley to reply for him. Oh, no, no stand-ins. Our offer of reply time is non-transferable. 20 to 4, back that up? Well, why not, with my Svengali-like influence on top officers of the corporation. McCarthy wants to rebut us. He does it in person. We supplied the senator with a kinescope of that program of March 9, and with such scripts and recordings as he requested. We placed no restrictions upon the manner or method of the presentation of his reply, and we suggested we would not take time to comment on this particular program. The senator chose to make his reply on film. Here now is Senator Joseph R. McCarthy, junior senator from Wisconsin. Uh, good evening. Mr. Edward R. Murrow, educational director of the Columbia Broadcasting System, <laughs> devoted his program to an attack on the work of the United States Senate Investigating Committee and on me personally as its chairman. Now, over the past four years, he has made repeated attacks upon me and those fighting coming. Now, ordinarily, ordinarily, I would not take time out from the important work at hand to answer Murrow. However, in this case, I feel justified in doing so because Murrow is the symbol, the leader, and the cleverest of the jackal pack, which is always found at the throat of anyone who dares to expose individual communists and traitors. What about the senator's charge that you were praised in the Daily Work? What about the Alger His Gentlemen, connection? Who do you think Gentlemen. won this round, you or McCarthy? Gentlemen and ladies, uh, I'll answer any questions a little later, but now I have a prepared... prepared is there statement. an official statement from CBS? Yes, there is, and you'll get a copy. Uh, first, a few comments on Senator McCarthy's broadcast. You will remember that the senator responded to our original comment that he had given considerable comfort to our enemies. His words as we took them down tonight were that if that were true, the senator ought not to be in the Senate. And if, on the other hand, Mr. Murrow is giving comfort to our enemies, he ought not to be brought into the homes of millions of Americans by the Columbia Broadcasting System. Well, I think the United States Senate will decide about Senator McCarthy, and CBS will decide about Ed Murrow. But when the record is finally written, as it will be someday, it will answer the question, who has helped the communist cause and who has served his country better, Senator McCarthy or I? 
I would like to be remembered by the answer to that question. There's a Gallup poll. Roper. Our own in-house poll. And Lazarbell's public opinion unit at Columbia. I wanted to share them with you, friendly. I'm, I'm not too good at statistical. Uh, it's not too difficult. 59% of the adult population watched or heard about the McCarthy reply. Of these, 38% believe he proved Murrow as a communist or raised serious doubts. That's a minority. I don't think you grasp the meaning here. I just got back from a high-level affiliates meeting with corporate executives representing sponsors. And they are very distressed. There's considerable opinion that attacks on Murrow can severely damage the competitive position of the network. Dr. Stanton, you're not saying you were against the program. As a matter of fact, I didn't know about it until 4 o'clock on Tuesday. But you believe what we said was true and in the public interest? Yes, I do. That's your job, and I think you do it professionally. But I want you and Ed to understand my concern. Controversy and the consequent negative public opinion hurt CBS's financial position. Well, you seem very strong supporting Ed against these attacks. Defending CBS against any attack is my job, and I think I do it professionally. But the majority of the CBS board is very troubled. I would describe their attitude as good show, but we wish you hadn't done it. Does Mr. Paley feel that way? I am speaking of my obligation to the corporation and the stockholders. I have to answer to them. John Hollenbeck's in the office. I thought he was in the hospital. He got out on Friday. Oh, good. His ulcer's all right then. He's got Jack O'Brien's column in the, in the journal. John is very upset. Very. He hasn't been. Maybe one or two. As far as I know, there hasn't been a problem since his ulcer kicked up. We have discovered the newscasts and telecasts generally of Edward R. Murrow and Don Hollenbeck to name the leading leaners to the left develop a peculiarly selective slant in most of their news work. Leaner to the left? Well, Brian must be mellowing. Usually I'm a pompous port setter. The rest of the column are letters attacking me. He solicited them. I wouldn't be surprised if he writes them himself. He's just out of the hospital, Don. Take it easy. What the hell do they want from me? They knock me off CBS Views the Press? Damn it, Ed, there's got to be something that we can do every damn day, column after column. It's not going to stop till I get my head in a goddamn platter. Look, you're in this job because you're a very good, incisive, and, and, and honest reporter. This is my last network, Ed. Don. It's just the columns every day, O'Brien and Pegler. Why don't they leave me alone? Don, listen to me. If anything happens, anything, I'll go to Paley myself, you understand? And he'll listen. I know him. He'll get me sooner or later. I mean, it isn't any use, is it? So, Senator, I asked him to go back to Boston. Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. Well, let's, let's, You've let's, done let's, enough. Have right. you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? He's on the run. Ed, that man is finished. Maybe. No. You're seeing this stuff live every day, and a recap on the 7 o'clock. You can't survive the exposure. And I'll tell you something. We started him downhill. There were a lot of others earlier. Flanders from Vermont, Margaret Chase Smith. Not on network television. You know, I really don't understand this shit kicking false modesty of yours. Well, I'm not too comfortable taking vows for courage, Fred. Where were we a year ago? Two years. My God, we're infected too. We hung back. We made excuses for not reporting what was right in front of us. That's the most self indulgent crap I ever heard. Ed, strap good. Tell him I haven't had a chance to look at the new contract yet. I'll call him Ed. Up. I think you better take this. Yeah, Jeff. Now a few words before the end of our program. One of the best programs I ever heard was called CBS Views the Press. A great many people liked it. Some didn't. No one ever said it was anything but honest. It was the work of an honest reporter, Don Hollenbeck. He had been sick lately, and he died this morning. The police said it was suicide. 
gas. Not much of an obit, but at least we had our facts straight, and it was brief. And that's all Don Hollenbeck would have asked. Good night, and good luck. Question. Back to the fourth week. Honor Kill a goddamn sound. I'm trying to do a show here. Not on camera. That's all I'm saying. We're in the second damn week of a show about smoking and cancer, and you sit there puffing. You're cutting our legs off. Well, I was smoking all through last week's show, if it's okay. Yeah, we were lucky. We didn't catch it on camera. Look, Ed, this is as hot a show as McCarthy. CBS and Alcoa have been taking a hell of a lot of heat from the tobacco industry. You could do without it for half an hour. I don't know, Fritz. Oh, don't you listen to your own narration. I'm not sure the link has been absolutely proved. Oh, come on, Ed. Well, in any case, I've been smoking 60 to 80 cigarettes a day for years. Even if I were convinced, I couldn't stop. That's correct. The last part of this $32,000 question. What's Dickens that? Dine with William New 10 o'clock show. Grant, Some kind of quiz. England, the Grant brothers were merchants famous in the town of Manchester for their benevolence. In what novel do the benevolent brothers appear? The Charitable Brothers. Nicholas Nichols. The Nicholson. Charitable Brothers in Nicholas Nichols. You're right! <laughs> <laughs> High school education. Should have been on it. God help us. That's the best television can offer in 1955. Good God. Your next question's worth $64,000. If you can hold off for a week, maybe... Who's going to watch Unrelieved Greed? The Unrelievedly Greedy. That may speak straight to the heart of America. Okay, Ed, we're coming up for air. We got that last reel re rack for Telecenter. You guys asleep up there or what? Come on, come on, talk to me. Any bets on how long we keep this time slot now? Wonderful lady. Impressive. My God, what an impressive season. Farm show. Ah, the Oppenheimer interview. Now, see, personally, I found that inspiring. Well, we appreciate your, your support on, on that one in particular, Bill. Yeah, we had a few moments there together, didn't we? <laughs> then counterattack, devoting in a whole issue on you as a pro-communist. Well, by God, we outlasted them. We'd like to go over some new ideas for this next season. I'd like to follow up South Africa with it. Right, yeah. You know, I've been thinking about that, and uh, I find those two-part shows very effective. In fact, the half hours now seem a little truncated to me, confining and limited. Uh, what do you mean? Well, why not a new format? Say, uh, eight to ten full hour, see it now. Uh-huh. What, uh, what time period? Well, nighttime, of course. I'm, I'm sure we can get a good sponsor. Is Alcoa definitely out? Yeah, they're out. They said something about a change in the market situation. They're concentrating on direct product sales. I, uh, I assume they, they feel that your audience does not buy pots and pans. Well, but, but that... Uh, uh, Bill, I think we'd just as soon stay with our, uh, our weekly, regular, identifiable time slot. Well, uh... Actually, Ed, there's a little problem there because uh, things have, have changed. Uh, Tuesday night, uh, 10 o'clock, $64,000 question. That's, that's now a top-rated show. And uh, the plan is to put in uh, probably two more big quiz shows. So uh, Tuesday night is very important to us now. You mean in terms of money? Sheer economics, yeah. Well, your time slot, 10.30, Tuesday night, is very important, a uh, very valuable piece of broadcast real estate to us. Alcoa only paid 50000 No sponsor's going to pay more than that for a documentary news show. So that time period means uh, over $5 million a year to CBS. Simple mathematics. I hope you, well, I'm sure you understand. Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying, Bill. 
Evet. My God, you had to try to save America every week, didn't you? Well, I want you to know that uh, political pressure had nothing to do with our thinking on this. I'm proud of the integrity of the, of the company for standing firm on that. Thank you, Bill. I think, uh, I think the important thing to remember is we have a great opportunity next year. Full hour to work with, best prime time. We just have to protect the show. It's a part of me. Maybe the best part. But you'll have my backing all the way, I promise you that. memo was that if they did this thing, my usefulness to CBS News would be at an end. I didn't show you the memo, Ed. I thought that... It's all right, Fred. I sent him a memo, too. Damn it, Bill. This is the third time they went over my head to give somebody Ed. a good reply time. Ed, thought... the man is a congressman. He made a very strong case. I mean, you put Harry Bridges on the air and he defamed the man. But you saw the show. Here it is. Run it. The congressman accused Bridges of running the island. Bridges laughed. He said casually, that's he crazy. He raised the whole that's fairness not issue. We no. know we have to respond nobody to that. Can. Damn it, Bill, nobody consulted me. Nobody consulted in me. In effect, CBS caves in to congressional blackmail. This is in a very untenable position. I don't see how. Because CBS implies publicly that we were unfair. Now, well, what we have to do is just sit down with everybody and set up something. There's some kind of editorial board. From now on. Things for future broadcasts. We have to have mood, some part and free reply decisions. And that way we can I we thought you and Fred didn't and, want to do so now make it possible anymore. to continue to well, of course we want to keep on doing see it now. I thought we decided that. You sent a memo to SIG. You said something about uh, circumstances uh, preclude our, our being able to do a see it You're now. You're killing the program. You just want to dump it been killing it by inches for a year. That isn't true at all. Sure, ever since you got rid of the weekly show. Every, every spot has to be sold separately to a sponsor. We have to fight with sales to get air dates. We couldn't build an audience because who the hell knew when we were going to be on. I went out personally and got Pan Am to sponsor us, and we got shoved over to the public service ghetto on Sunday afternoon. And now you're... All right, Fred, take it easy. What for the show? I held on as long as possible. Whom did you fight, Bill? You're the chairman of the board, aren't you? Chairman of the... Judas Priest, Ed. What do you, what do you think? Everything on the network is my personal taste? The westerns, the, the, the soaps, the silly comedies, the damn quiz shows? This is a business, for God's sake. Is that all we are, Bill? Is that what you're telling me now? God, how many damn fool dinners have we been to where we both got up and made speeches about the public trust? But the mission of broadcasting, but integrity, conscience. We both have walls lined with plaques and awards and certificates, honors. Did we deserve them? What in the hell are we, Bill? Pimps for the $64,000 question? Pimps? You know something, Ed? Sometimes I get very tired. We've been friends for 20 years. I'm going to tell you something. You had it easy. It is damned easy to, to indulge a, a delicate conscience, to hew to a pure and unsullied integrity. It's easy because you have none of the responsibilities of the real world. The world of boards of directors, finance, profit and loss, company stocks, the damn stockholders. I fought for you, Ed. I maneuvered and I wheedled and I backed you all the way because I believe in you and your conscience and your integrity. God, I love it. I love you. But you've had the easy path, my friend. It's no trick to be a saint when somebody else is setting up the stage for your miracles. 
Where do you think you'd be if that it is the most hey, self centered self hey, self Let me finish! Where do you think you'd be if it hadn't been for me taking the heat? From those slimy bastards running counterattack? From McCarthy? And you have no idea how high up that pressure came from. What do you think happened to those people that got caught in the buzzsaw there? They were blacklisted. They were dropped like a hot potato. Where did they end up? Sleeping pills, selling shoes, teaching journalism in some jerkwater college. But not you, my friend. But not you. What, do you think you were immune? You think God was protecting you? I'll tell you who was protecting you. I was protecting you. And Frank Stanton, running his ass off down to Washington every time you call down one of those lightning shafts of yours. I know. I know. You remember after the McCarthy broadcast? I phoned you, told you something my grandfather used to say down in Carolina. You're the kind of man I would like to go hunting with. All right, we have just about the best crew anybody ever put together. And the, the writers, camera, editors, production. I just can't believe you really intend to shut it down. Just scatter staff it took so long to put together. You really want to destroy all this? Don't you want a, an instrument into which you poured so much for so long to continue? Yes. Yes, but I get tired of this constant stomachache every time you do a, a controversial subject. It's the price you have to pay, Bill. It goes with the job. This instrument can teach. It can illuminate. Damn it, it can inspire. But only to the extent that it's used to those ends. Otherwise, it's merely wires and lights in a box. You exaggerate, Ed. There'll be good shows. To be important shows. Something is dying, Bill. It may take a long time, but it's dying. Generally, fatigue? <clears throat> More frustrated than fatigued. I don't suppose there's any chance of you getting away. My contract allows me a sabbatical six months to a year. Huh? CBS let you? At the moment? I think so. Janet and I have been talking about a trip around the world. Well, I'd like to order a couple of tests. They'll take a few days. What are you looking for? I'm not really sure. Bronchospasm? Possible pulmonary emphysema? Let's cross that bridge when we come to it. Scotch? There isn't any ice. Some incompetent forgot to fill the ice tray. That works falling apart. <laughs> well, to the network, then. To CBS. I came here just about the same time. Ed Clover hired me. Director of Talks, Educational Religious Special. I forgot what your title was. Research Specialist. 55 bucks a week. I suppose that's the basic difference between us, Frank. I'm Talks, Educational, Religious, Special, what they ought to hear. And you're the expert on what they want to hear. Well, we better give them what they want in order to help pay for what you and I think they need. That's the business we're in, Ed. I know. I've always been aware that uh, you gave CBS News the freedom to work independently. 
and that you protected us from any outside pressures. But I've often pondered whether you would have gotten rid of See It Now if it had been up to you. I saw few of our stockholders understand that the integrity of your side of the schedule is necessary to establish the reputation of the network. And that makes profit possible. You saying I make the $64,000 question possible? Well, I suppose there is a difference in what is in the public interest and what the public is interested in. It is a delicate and necessary balance. Jesuitical, Frank. If not Talmudic. Ed, you and I can stand on the shore and tell the tide not to change. But it will come and sweep us away. And the $64,000 question is the rock that will endure. Well, that's an interesting question. I think we're in for some trouble there. Ratings down? No, no, no. There's some scandal brewing on the horizon about cheating. Giving the answers in advance. It's rigging the whole thing to squeeze the most drama out of their shabby exercise in greed. Heresy. Well, if this win this breaks, we're going to face considerable embarrassment. Bill will expect me to handle it. You will. And you'll do it gracefully. And Paley will never have a stomachache again. <laughs> yes? Yes, we had a copy of Stanton's speech here in London. I saw it. What? No, I... <coughs> I thought he was just covering up after the quiz scandals broke. No, I haven't seen the New York Times. I've been busy with the Krishna Menon piece for Small World. What follow-up? Wait a minute. Jack Gould called Stanton and said, read it to me. Some stupidity about the quiz show scandal. <coughs> he named person to person as an example of deceptive programming? Because we go over the questions? How does he think we get three tons of lights and equipment into somebody's house without asking? No, I haven't heard anything directly from CBS. No, any comment will come. Yes, I will take care of it. Frank Stanton doesn't know the first goddamn thing about... Sorry, excuse me. I thought his speech was about cleaning up the quiz shows and no dubbed laugh tracks or canned applause. Well, he used me as an example of the prevailing dishonesty. That's outrageous. Dr. Stanton displays ignorance both of news and the requirements of television production. I gather that's a public statement? The beginning of one, yes. And Mr. Murrow went on. I am sorry that Dr. Stanton feels I have participated in perpetrating a fraud on the public. My conscience is clear. His seems to be troubling him. Say something like that. Bill, I am angry, very angry at Ed. There's absolutely no excuse for a personal attack of this sort. It's an act of disloyalty to CBS. Uh, maybe it sounded to him like... Excuse me, Bill, the dilemma is whether we like it or not. Ed has become the public symbol of CBS integrity and honesty. With all this quiz scandal mud about the last thing we can afford is an open break with him. Uh, I'd better fly to London and explain what I said was not directed at him no, personally. Oh, oh no. Uh, no. Dr. Stanton, that would be most unadvisable. We can't put you in that position. You need a certain protection. We need an insulation against any Somebody possible... else is a go-between? I think they're right, Frank. I think in his state of mind, uh, you might seem more like a, an irritant than a mediator. I think we'd better send somebody else to London. If you boil it down, it's a very humble apology. I don't understand. By whom? By me. They issued this statement drawn up by some legal weasel from CBS, a total apology to Stanton, and they expect me to sign it. Did you call Frank in New York? We went back and forth three times. Very cordial, you know Stanton. But I kept my temper. I'm not going to sign that thing, and they're not going to back down. Well, what happens? In effect, I've been fired from CBS, only they don't know how to do it. But your contract is still in force. That's not the problem. They'd pay it off cheerfully. There are three or four congressional committees looking for headlines in this quiz scandal. How long do you think it'd take one of them to subpoena me? It's not just this thing that's down. It's very clear to me. 
Somehow my time with the network is over. Somewhere I made some kind of a bargain. I got better terms than old Dr. Faustus. They only wanted a little bit of my soul. But it begins to look as if Mephisto doesn't need me at all anymore. Body or soul. You remember the pub that used to be over there? Mm-hmm. Big sign across the front, Courage. You thought it was very touching. Until I told you it was just the name of the beer. <laughs> <laughs> I went by the day after it was bombed out. The barmaid was standing there. Remember her? Big woman, frizzy hair. There was nothing left. The building was just a pile of rubble. She looked at it and she said, seems like a lot of trouble to go to just to tell me my services are no longer required. I don't know why I remembered that. Circuit affiliates, friendly, take one. In a few days, or next week, I will be giving up my office and moving into the office next to mine, which says on the door, and will continue to say, Murrow. We've been working together, Ed and me, for 10 years now. And now he will be going to do a harder job, and perhaps a more important job. The President of the United States has decided that he shall now be the official Voice of America and run the United States Information Service. He is in Washington now, where he is already trying to learn how to push all the buttons. Ed Murrow. You know, friendly begins to sound like the voice of doom, doesn't he? I am not sure I can say what I want to say. Now that I've become a bureaucrat, I must have a care as to what I say. It, uh, it is naturally a, a little difficult to uh, leave the shop after 25 years, to leave a lot of good friends. I would think it fair and honest to say that some part of my heart will stay with CBS. I am grateful to the management of CBS for releasing me, grateful to the affiliates who have carried what we've done, although not always approving, grateful in particular for the friendship of my colleagues and superiors, and uh, to the CBS Reports viewing audience uh, which is uh, now about to be increased by one. And I wish you all good luck. And good night. Thank you, Ed. Now, next Thursday night, Without Murrow, CBS Reports brings you a report on the business of health. Did you get your call? Yes, thank you. Uh, they uh, changed my flight to an overnight. Oh, but you just came in this morning. Yeah. You know, I can't tell you how surprised I was that you met me at the airport. Of course, he shouldn't have, but he doesn't listen to the doctors. How is he, Janet? You know, I haven't seen him since, uh, well, since he resigned in Washington. Well, they say he's recovering from the pneumonia, but it's very chancy. I mean, with the lung operation last year, and the radiation took an awful lot out of him. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, I didn't know whether to come out here or not. I, uh, I wasn't sure how you'd feel about it.
Well, I don't think you'd be too comfortable in the new building. Somebody told me they call it Black Rock. Black Rock, right. It's Frank's brainchild. All the walls are temporary. I have a feeling I could leave the office some night. And some mechanic could come in there with a screwdriver and a pair of pliers and change my office into the cafeteria by morning. <coughs> Very strange things are happening. I look at the reports from Frank's office. All the ratings are leveling off. There doesn't seem to be any difference between the networks anymore. Well, if they all follow the same safe rules, they end up with the same safe programs. It's not even like being in the broadcasting business. It's more like the business business. Well, isn't that what you used to talk about? Power, the use of power? Well, we used it pretty well together, didn't we? Shake them up fairly well. McCarthy broadcast. That was important. Yeah, I think we reached our full potential on that one. And we did it together, didn't we? Yes, we did it together. Now it's so damn complicated. One man making a decision doesn't seem to make anything happen anymore. It's all in the hands of the administrators. They make all the decisions. I miss you, goddammit. I think I even miss the, uh, the stomach aches. Now, look here. I would like you to come back and work as a consultant for us. Not too realistic, Bill. You remember we did the first network broadcast on smoking and lung cancer? It was a very clear and detailed description of metastasy. We did a very good job in those days. Any layman could understand it. <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, there are a few residual obligations that you owe CBS. You never left, you were just on leave. So, um... I think I'll hold you to that. I was thinking of London during the war, remember? I remember one night in an air raid. You wouldn't let us go to a bomb shelter. Of course not. You start going down in those shelters, you lose your nerve. <laughs> it was the arrogance of being young. I used to fantasize about dying in some heroic context. That was indeed an arrogant thought. When I went to Washington, I said, I want to wear out, not rust out. But I would be a poor reporter if I were not aware that I am indeed rusting. Corroding, wearing thin. Before we moved west from Carolina, I must have been six. My mother used to sing to us. And her favorite was a camp meeting song. You got a hole to the end of the row.
Excuse me, Mr. Payne. Oh, I'm sorry. You're meeting your wife at 21 at 8.30. Right. The uh, board meeting at the museum doesn't begin until uh, 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Dr. Stanton is here. Oh, Frank, thank you for coming by. The uh, network statement went out, Dave? We broke for a bulletin. Uh -huh. There'll be an instant special at 11.30. Good. We've had it ready ever since the brain tumor operation failed. Right. Good. I can run it for you. No, no, I, I don't want to see it. You have your statement ready. He was a resolute and uncompromising man of truth. His death ends the first golden age of television journalism. I shall miss him greatly, as will all of us here at CBS. But one thing we know, his imprint will be felt by broadcasting for all time to come. We can have it changed. No, it's fine. It's fine. Thank you very much.